Good Sunday morning, Sunny Hills, on this beautiful September 27th, 2020. A send-off for Bertie Ellis is in the planning stages. She's going to be moving to Washington State, yet keeping her house here in Brea for her family to live in and to take care of. And she will be making visits back here occasionally. When more details of Bertie's send-off are finalized, they will be announced right here. Our drive-in service continues live on Sundays at 9 a.m. in the Upper Church parking lot. Communion is provided. Kids Experiences today at 11 a.m. It's available on social media. You can find parent guides and videos on our website to help your kids have more fun learning stories from the Bible. Again, those premiere every Sunday at 11 a.m. Gospel Scenes Bible Study continues Wednesdays afternoon at 6 on Zoom. The youth group meets at Thursdays at 6 o'clock at the Elliott's house in their backyard. And there are two homework hangouts this week. One is Tuesdays at 4 on Zoom, and the other is Thursdays at 4 at the Elliott's home. Check in with Madi if you need the Zoom links for any of these. There will be no chili cook-off nor trunk or treat during uh, the upcoming holiday seasons because of the COVID virus. And so many of you have continued to support our church during the pandemic, and for that, we are very, very grateful. If you would like to support our Sunny Hills family, you can mail in your check or drop it off at the church by first calling Brenda, our great church secretary, to make sure she's going to be there to meet you, or you can give online directly through your bank account. And a very happy birthday today to Nancy Dorknack, Dana Smoot, and Don Jordan. Happy birthday, guys. Thanks again for joining us. Take care of yourselves and please know that you are missed. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. To see you shining in the light of your glory. Lord, pour out your power and love. As we sing, holy, 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 high and lifted up, to see you shining in the light of your glory. Lord, pour out your power and love, as we sing, holy, 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 open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, to see you shining in the light of your glory. Lord, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. High and lifted up to see you shining in the light of your glory. Lord, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Remembrance of me, eat this bread.
me drink this wine in remembrance of me. church there's a YouTube video making the rounds now um, one of these uh, videos where one person sings all of the parts um, and it's really lovely it's it's 1500 years of, of Christian music um, and he starts off with a, 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 a hymn uh, called be thou my vision uh, which uh, I promised Connie I wouldn't sing but uh, um, if you don't know the song it, it uh, just the first uh, one goes be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day and by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. What I didn't know until I saw that video was that that song is, is very old. It actually dates from the, the sixth century, and it's a, an Irish poem written by a, an Irish saint named uh, Dalen Fagoyle. And I thought about what this man's world must have been like. The, the Roman Empire had left Britain a hundred years earlier. Uh, you know, the, the island is torn by war. Uh, you know, barbarians are invading the shores. And, and he writes this poem that says, you know, what do I want most? I want, I want God to be my vision. I want God to be uh, the center of, of my world. And, and he could certainly be forgiven for being worried about all the troubles he was facing. I guess his name actually means blind one. Uh, uh, in Irish and just in all of the troubles that we're going through now and all the the pressures that we're facing uh, I thought I just we should just take this moment in communion to, to think about how to make God our vision how to think about the sacrifice that Jesus made for us so that's that was my my thought as uh, as we take communion this Sunday we pray with me dear God please please be my vision be the Lord of my heart Lord and Please help me to stay focused on you, not the trials and tribulations and the problems that, that we're facing, but, but on you and, and what you want for us. Um, you know, as the song ends, it says, High King of Heaven, my victory won. And we know that's true, and we do this in remembrance of you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We pray with me for the uh, the juice. 
Dear God, thank you for letting us have this remembrance of you. Um, you understand how quickly we forget and how much we need community in, in doing these acts together and, and in remembrance of your son. Um, thank you for the blessings that you've poured on us and guide us through this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be safe, be at peace, and we hope to see you in person soon. Bye. Bye. Good morning, Sunny Hills Church, and uh, hope you're enjoying the Sunday service. Today we are continuing our discussion of the fruit of the Spirit, and we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. Now, I was going to skip goodness because kindness and goodness uh, seem pretty much the same uh, in the sense that if you're if you're doing good things you're probably also doing acts of kindness and so maybe they'd be indistinguishable but my wife Jill uh, let me in on a little known secret among preachers and that is that not secret it's a rule and that is if you are uh, doing a series on a list of things in the Bible you're not allowed to skip any and so I just found that out. So I'm doing the fruit of the Spirit is goodness today. Um, so I'm thinking if Christmas actually comes this year, which I'm not sure I expect that it will, this may be the year the Grinch finally succeeds. Uh, but I hope not. But if it does, we might see on buses and billboards uh, and elsewhere the uh, slogan that I've seen before around Christmas time. When, when uh, these words, be good for goodness sake, appear. And they seem innocuous enough. I mean, they're good words. They're in our song that we like to sing. Uh, he knows when you are sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good, for goodness sake. Um, nothing wrong with that. That sounds great. Um, but that's not exactly what it says on the billboards and and the uh, um, sides of buses and things like that. It's a little bit different. It does say be good for goodness sake, but it adds the word just. Just be good for goodness sake is what it says. And it it means something. It means something very specific. The idea behind it, it comes from those who have a humanist perspective in that they, they believe that humans are basically good. Sure, there's a few bad eggs among us, but humans are basically good and, and we don't need God. We don't need Jesus. We don't need a church. We don't need the Holy Spirit. We don't need any of those reasons to be good. We, we, we just need to be good for goodness sake, it's good to be good. It's good for everybody to be good. We, sh we should be good for that reason. People are basically good, so sh we should be good. Uh, that's, that's the idea behind it. And uh, we just don't need any of that religion stuff. We don't need a religious holiday uh, celebrating Jesus, you know, the gift of God in order for us to be giving gifts. Um, we just don't need any of that. We should just be good for goodness sake. Um, well, that... That's not a biblical worldview. Let me just put it that way. The, the Bible doesn't see humanity that way. Um, certainly, creation shows that when God created humanity, he created humanity in his image. And, and when he, he made everything, he saw that it was very good. And everything he created was good. And so, so humanity was created to be in the image of God, to be good and to fill the earth with God's goodness. That's true. But something happened. There was a fall. Uh, humans tried to uh, be like God in a way, uh, apart from listening to God, in a different way, listening to the voice of a different one. And, uh, and that brought the fall and the, the corruption of humanity. And, and so, and so, Hum, humans are are not good by nature. 
is not just that there are a few bad eggs among us. People are not generally good. We, we are fallen. We live in, in a world of darkness, of corruption and evil. And, and, and this is the way the Bible describes humanity apart from God, apart from the influence of God. In, in Romans chapter 1, in speaking generally about people, and in a moment specifically about the Jews in chapter 2 and following, but in 3, but, but just speaking about in chapter 1 about, about people in general, it says in chapter 118, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen by what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their futility, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. When people do not acknowledge God, when they don't think about God, when they don't uh, listen to God, according to the Bible, their hearts are darkened and they become foolish and futile. And so that doesn't sound like, well, people are basically good. doesn't sound like that at all. But he goes on. A uh, lot uh, more of that is here, but I just want to read a little bit of it in chapter 3, where he says, now he's talking to uh, pretty much the Jews as they kind of look at the Gentiles uh, and judge them because they're not, you know, they haven't been following the law of Moses and, and uh, obeying God in those ways. And so we're not sure they're acceptable to Jesus because, uh, you know, they just haven't been good enough. There's kind of this judgmental thing going on. But he says, what shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They together become worthless. There is no one who does good. There is no one who does good not even for goodness sake. There just isn't anyone who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they have not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes. According to the Bible, when you eliminate God from your perspective, you, you have put yourself in darkness. And, and that doesn't bring anything good. And so Jew or Gentile, all humanity, when ignoring God, there's darkness. And it, it becomes darkness in our lives. So, so this is the thing. This is the perspective of humanity. And, and if that weren't enough, even just the cross itself the cross has been anchored in human history as a mirror <laughs> forever exposing the human condition that we are in such darkness that we wouldn't know goodness if it walked among us. We wouldn't recognize God if he walked among us. The Jews shouted, crucify him because they did not like Jesus' truth. The Romans, well, the Roman leader said, who cares about truth? What is truth? It's not that he didn't know what the word truth meant, but who cares about truth? He knew Jesus was innocent and it let him be crucified anyway, not caring about truth. In darkness, humanity's in darkness. So let me take a minute and just sort of and maybe try to answer why it is perhaps that sometimes it appears that people can be good without God. 
without Jesus, without the church, without the Bible. Um, because we've known good people. I have, many of you have, known good people. People, well, at least who seem good, maybe even better than some Christians we know, but who don't go to church. They don't have religious stuff going on. They're not seeking God. They're not, you know, praying. They're not talking about Jesus. So, so how do we explain that uh, if, if we've had that experience? How do we explain it? Well, I can think of a, a couple ways, uh, by no means exhaustive, but one is that things aren't always as they seem. We've got to realize uh, sometimes we're really good at wearing masks. How many times have we heard or uh, seen on the news or heard uh, the co-workers of an employee or the neighbors of the people who lived in that house or the guy who lived in the house? How many times have we heard them say, or, or maybe even some mom or dad who did something terrible to their children? Or I mean, there's so many horrible stories out there, but how many times have we heard those who knew them say something like, or, you know, th that person was the nicest person you could ever meet. Uh, they, they were great neighbors. They're quiet, never did anything wrong. Oh, yeah, that he, he seemed like the greatest guy you'd ever meet. I mean, these kinds of things, you know. Uh, how many times have we heard that? This is a reality. We, we don't always know what's going on with people. Sometimes people can look like they've got it all together because they're good at wearing masks. But underneath, we have no idea what darkness is there. So that's, that would answer some cases. But there might be some people that we know, and maybe we know them fairly well, and, and they're pretty good people, like I said, maybe even better than some Christians we know. And, uh, but, but they don't have church, they don't have religion, they don't uh, have the Bible, they don't pray, they, they don't trust in Jesus. I mean, you know, so how, how, why? why? How do we explain that? Well, another possibility. And so I, I, think, about, I think about my children, uh, Unfortunately, sometimes kids don't always uh, grow up and follow in the faith of their parents. And, and uh, so God forbid, I don't want it to happen to my kids. But, but let's say, for instance, I, one of my daughters, like, let me take Mackenzie. She's our 21-year-old. She's in college. Let's say, you know, in college she meets a boy and uh, moves off somewhere to live, uh, they get married and have their family and do all that. And, and, and let's say that, that that boy is not interested in any of that church stuff. And so she just leaves it behind. You know, God forbid, I don't want her to do that. But but let's say she just leaves it all behind, doesn't pay any more attention to it from the rest, rest of her life. So 20 years down the road, all the people she knows, the soccer moms and the families and the PTA people and getting together, you know, she's she's she has a, a foundation of faith. She has a foundation, been in, in, with Jesus all her life, in the Bible all her life, in prayer and relying on God and, and being blessed by the church all her life. And so she has 21 years of that as a foundation. But let's say there's there, after that, she just pays no attention to it for, for the next 30 or 40 years. Everybody who knows her, if they're asked, hey, what about that Mackenzie? How's she? Oh, she's great. You think she's a good person? Yeah, she's, she's great. She's one of the best people I know. Uh, is she honest? Yeah, she's honest. Is she lying? No, she doesn't lie. Is, is she generous? Oh, yeah, she uh, helps out down at that one project or... Or over there where those people need. Yeah, I see it all the time. Yeah, she's great. And she volunteers for the different teacher stuff and, and the, the parent stuff. And yeah, she's great. Yeah, uh, does she go to church? No, I don't think she goes to church. I've never seen her go to church. Talk about Jesus? No. Read a Bible? I don't ever see her read a Bible. Um, so th that can happen. Th there can be a lot of people out there who, who were raised and have a foundation in faith and raised with the, the, the knowledge of God and the, the scriptures and the Holy Spirit and, and just living like they like it's not part of their life anymore, but the values and the morals and the ethics and the standards and the, the you know the, the the work of God is still evident. And so in them, you know, there's there's a lot of people who are good. God's not getting the credit for it that he deserves. And so that that's a possibility that we may meet a lot of people like that. And take it a step further. 
what if what if Mackenzie has uh, our grandchildren and now they're 17 or whatever and they're they're involved in their school stuff and you know they're doing sports or or drama or you know theater or whatever and they're they're involved in all this stuff and they they know all those parents from all those things they do and they're always getting together and everybody knows them and they know these kids and the kids hang around everywhere together and and you ask those other kids hey what about that uh, that one Mackenzie's kids uh, how are they oh yeah they're they're good kids you trust them oh yeah I trust them with my life they good? Yeah, they, they, they're honest? Oh, yeah, they're really honest. They're really good people. Best people I knew. They go to church? No, I never heard anything about going to church. They read the Bible? I don't think they read the Bible. Never heard about that. They, they follow Jesus or anything? No, I don't think so. You see, it's possible for, in this scenario, it's possible for someone who has a firm foundation from their youth, who's carried on that goodness into their life, even if they haven't paid any attention to their faith, it's possible for them to raise their children in that same kind of goodness because they found that it was good and, and moral and upright and it's a blessing to do that kind of stuff. It, it, it works out well for your friendships and your employer and, and your neighbors. And so you do this. And then, uh, then now you've got a whole generation, the next generation, who are, who are really good and without any sign of God there. Say, well, how come they're so good? And God doesn't get any credit. So that's what I'm saying is sometimes we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. We don't know what's going on behind the mask. Of course, everyone's wearing a mask now, right? But we, but we don't know what's going on behind there. Maybe, maybe they're not as good as they look. Or maybe God's not getting the credit he deserves. That at least explains a lot of it. I mean, in, in fact, especially if you think we have a nation. We have a nation that had in, in the fabric of its founding and it, its uh, you know generations of its, its founding and leaders Judeo-Christian ethics, the Bible, Ten Commandments in the courthouses and schools and, and parks, used to be anyway, uh, the, you know, these biblical principles, uh, all men created equal by their creator, right, endowed with cer certain inalienable rights. This, this is in our fabric of our being here. And so God doesn't get any credit for all of that either when we think about, well, there's, good, there's some goodness without God. It's not necessarily without God. So I just want to say that. The biblical worldview is humanity's fallen. It's in darkness. Humanist worldview is, oh, humanity is pretty good. They're good. They don't really need God. It's just two different worldviews. So, and not just, you know, let's get back to the, the biblical view. Not just in general. We, we heard Paul talking about in general how people are. But even specifically, what would Paul say about being good, just being good for goodness sake? not having anything to do with God. What do you say about him personally? You know, we read in Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about this struggle with just trying to be good enough and trying to do good. And, and he says in, in chapter 7, he says in verse 18, he says, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful flesh or nature. For I have the desire to do what is good but I cannot carry it out. I can't just be good for goodness sake, he says. Even when I want to, I can't do it. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Paul's talking about a struggle with, with trying to do good things for, for other reasons, like just trying to do it to be good enough or to, to follow law or something like that. Um, but he says, I, I can't even do the good I want to do. There's this, there's this struggle. And he goes on to say, uh, what in verse 24, what a wretched man I am, who will save me from this body of death? And the salvation is, he says, but thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so God recognizes there's this kind of dichotomy. There's this, there's this battle going on. And, and, and the only way to be free from the battle is to get away from this idea that, that we can be good enough. We can just be good people. We have to acknowledge that we are lost and we need saving and therefore we need a savior and we need Jesus and we need the cross. And that's where we can we begin to be good because now we're allowing the spirit of God to work in us. We accept his forgiveness. We accept his Holy Spirit. And now it's his work in us the fruit of the Spirit. And this is important that we make this distinction. It's important that we know this, that, 
that humanity is lost and needing a savior. And and that and that in being saved, God wants to produce in us this other thing, this other fruit. Because there's just there's there's two conflicting worldviews going on. There's the darkness of the world, and then there's the light of God. And this is why in the in the in the fruit of the spirit passage, I think this is why Paul lays them out in contrast. This is what it looks like without God, and this is what it looks like with God. Look in Galatians chapter five. This is this is the passage that we've been looking at for now for for these weeks, uh, where it talks about the fruit of the spirit. But 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 in verse nineteen, he says this: the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions. Oh my goodness, we have a lot of dissensions and factions right now. A lot of rage going on in our country. Uh, And envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's, that's not goodness. That's not a good way to live. That's, that's, that's the world without God. And then he says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And against these things there is no law. And he says, those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desire, desires. We are not just basically good. Where we are in the world without Jesus is, is needing to be crucified. The flesh, the desires of the flesh need to be crucified so that we can put off the sinful nature and put on the nature of Christ to stop the works of the flesh, to put to death the misdeeds of the body, like Paul says, through the Holy Spirit. And to put on Christ and to bear his fruit in the world. Think of the contrast. Just think of this. What if the world we lived in, rather than all this stuff, the factions, the dissensions, the the discord, the jealousy, the fits of rage, uh, idolatry and hatred and all this. What if instead of all that stuff, what if the world was filled with the fruit of the Spirit? What if we replaced all that stuff with the fruit of the Spirit? Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. What if that filled the world? Imagine what a different world it would be. It would be radically different. That's what God's trying to do. That's what he's trying to do. For those who come to him, he, he's trying to fill us with his spirit. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind, by the Holy Spirit he's poured into us. He wants to change the product of our lives, the fruit of our lives. And he wants, to, he, wa- he wants us to be in this continual process of saying no to that stuff, that world stuff, that worldly stuff. Crucify that stuff and allow the spirit to live in us so that our lives are filled with his stuff. And when that happens, one person at a time, it, 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 it creates a God space in people's lives, a holy space where we are like a temple, the, the Holy Spirit living in us, God living in us. We are a temple where people can experience God through the fruit God is bearing in our lives. This world needs that. Our culture needs that. Our neighborhoods need that. Our cities need that. Of course, our country needs that. And I guess imagine if all of this stuff of the flesh was replaced with all of that stuff of the spirit in the world around us, in the people around us. Wouldn't it be a a blessed place to be? That's what God wants. That's what God's trying to do. That's why it's so important for us to daily lay our lives down Offer our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is the way we worship God. So, well, let's let's pray, Father. Right now, we just we just pray in everyone who's listening to this, and in every Christian, 
and every heart that's able to receive your word, that you would empower us to say no to all that stuff that comes from the human condition, the broken human condition, and say yes to everything you want to replace it with from your Holy Spirit, which is is not only the antithesis, but it's the antidote for all of the, the brokenness of humanity. Fill us with your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this morning. Enjoy your Sunday. Bye-bye. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, see that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence. My light, be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. Thou in now and always, Thou and the only first in my heart, I King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. Be Thou my battle shield, sword for my fight. Thank you.